Welcome to Unsolved South Carolina, the Murdochs, Murders, Money, and Mystery. We are here today with our exclusive legal analyst, former South Carolina Attorney General Charlie Condon. We have our executive producer for Unsolved South Carolina, Drew Tripp, and myself, Ann Emerson. Thank you for joining us. Today we're going to be speaking uh, a little bit about where we are with the federal case against Alec Murdoch. Uh, yesterday, uh, to get everyone up to speed, uh, Alec Murdoch came to court. He was shackled. He was uh, accompanied by several armed guards in the federal court to plead guilty. He was changing his plea from not guilty to guilty on 22 counts of financial fraud, theft, money laundering. And when he walked in, he was, you know, uh, my photog, uh, Sam Griswold, who's also taking care of us today behind the camera, uh, he, we were discussing what color yellow he was wearing because it was a very bright color. And I have to say, Alec Murdoch had a very bright countenance about him as well. He seemed to smile from the moment he got out of his van all the way up to the courtroom throughout the entire proceeding. Uh, and it just raised a lot of questions about why this man would be happy about pleading guilty to 22 counts or, or, or even just looking pleased mm -hmm. with the whole day. Um, so I want to kick it off with we are now dealing with the first time, according to um, Emily Limehouse, who was prosecuting this case for the federal government, she said this is the first time we've seen Alec Murdoch truly held accountable for his financial crimes. It's interesting. Uh, I th think you could, by the way, I have a lot of respect for her. I think she's a terrific prosecutor. I think in a certain sense, you, you could say that is correct. However, and I want to focus on the mystery here. The mystery to me is why the federal government in the first place is uh, involved with prosecuting him for financial crimes. You know, step back from this. He's He's now he's in he's in state prison. He's been convicted of of two consecutive life sentences crimes. These murders. And in state court, they have made it very clear they're going to seek life without parole for three strikes and you're in for three separate breach of trust with fraudulent intention crimes. The first case of which is set for November. Those cases are really easy to plead, uh, to prosecute. He admitted in his murder case, I sat there as he testified under oath that he committed those crimes. He's now pled in federal court, which I guess you say can, can help that somewhat. But, you know, you can only spend one day at a time in prison. And so you've got a um, defendant now who, he's going to have three consecutive life sentences in state court. So the use of, of federal resources to come in and have a dual prosecution to me, it's, it's a mystery. It's a mystery. What do you think, Drew? It, it, to dovetail with that, to piggyback off that a little bit, I, I don't know that it is so much accountability when you, take into, when you take into mind how much stalling and hand-wringing and kicking and screaming that's gone on to get us to that point to where we are now with, with Alec yeah. Murdoch and his, his attorneys. And it, it's this total one a like why, why are they fighting so hard? We just sat there in a, a state courtroom in Beaufort County last week uh, where they're fighting tooth and nail to prevent actually going to trial. Oh, yeah, remember that? They said they were too busy, in effect. They had to pull their calendar out. We can't go to trial in state court. And here they rush over to federal. To, and, you know, it's got to be, don't you think, prison shopping? They're hoping to yes. get in the federal system. Yeah, I, I, I spoke to a former prosecutor about this yesterday. Just on background, he's not involved with the case. Uh, just trying to get my wits about me a little bit. And he, he seemed pretty confident that, that this is, that's all this is. Um, and the other thing you have to take into context with what's going on with Alec is, okay, first and foremost, his attorney's job is to keep him out of prison. It's to make it immensely hard for the prosecutors, whether they be federal or state, to prove his guilt, okay? 
once that ship has sailed, once he's proven guilty, and once it's clear that he's going to prison, they didn't have to minimize that, right? It's their job to minimize that and keep him in prison for as short amount of time as possible. And beyond that, to if he's never getting out of prison, which is the clear takeaway on all this. And Emily, uh, Emily Limehouse said that yesterday, that, that that's the end goal for everyone, is to make sure that Alec Murdoch is never a free man again. If that's going to be the case, it's... Jim and Dick's job to make sure that he's in the best possible living conditions that he can get, if which, I, I, and I, I asked someone this, is, is it really that simple? Is it really as simple as federal prison is so much better than state prison that, that you would do everything you could to get him in there? And he's told me, yeah, it's that simple. Why? Why is, why is... more programs, typically the uh, amenities, shall we speak, shall we say, are, are, are better. Uh, I've heard reports sometimes that's not necessarily the case, but just generally speaking, uh, a defendant, if he or she has the choice, they almost always choose choose federal. And so I guess that's why it's such a mystery to me, because if you bring these federal resources in, you know, this is, of course, taxpayer money, right? We're like, okay, let's decide to have a federal investigation, a federal prosecution for Alec Murdoch. He's got two life sentences consecutive in state court. He's facing a third, and it's just not facing it. That Those are easy. Those three cases are going to be really easy to prove. Well, he's already said he did it. I mean, he said, I stole the money. I know, and I, I heard them, and he testified in, in, his, in his murder trial. And That's so right. uh, all the state has to do is put those cases, make sure the lawyers aren't too busy to come to court. They were not busy, too busy yet the other day to come to federal court. So Not too busy to go it? to Crime Con. They're going to Crime Con. They're on their way to Crime Con. Sorry. Did you know that? No. <laughs> Dick Harputlian and Jim Griffin are on their way to CrimeCon as we speak. Now, what is that? It's like a it's like a true crime conference where everybody gets together and you bring in all of the big authors and celebs to talk about um, different wow. crime cases. I need to process that. I, 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 <laughs> we'll give you a minute, Charlie. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't mean to throw, that, no, throw a, that to you. I thought it was something like that you're referencing, but I didn't quite realize that it's exactly that, right? These it, are like literally true they, crime they, people? Absolutely. True crime aficionados wow. from all over, all over the wow. world probably will be wow. showing up to this. Wow. We did have a chance after mm -hmm. this federal hearing, and there's a lot more mm -hmm. I'd like to unpack about yeah, this the federal hearing. Is he, yeah. he, they, he, they struck a deal. I mean, mm -hmm. they, they struck a deal for Alec. So I want to talk about what that deal entailed. But one thing, going back to federal versus state prison time, um, we, we very much directly asked Ms. Limehouse, um, is, there, is this a goal of the federal government to get him into mm -hmm. a federal prison? Mm -hmm. Do you plan on mm -hmm. pushing for a right. federal prison sentence? And she said, you know, absolutely not. Mm -hmm. uh, no, we have no plans to change where he is. We have no plans to mm -hmm. put him into federal custody mm -hmm. at all. And I know, of course, things can change. And then I think that's when she kind of followed up or had been talking mm -hmm. around the fact that he, uh, you know, basically that this was uh, a, an opportunity to make sure that he never got out of prison wherever he is. He's never getting out. He's always going to be locked up. But it just adds to the mystery, doesn't it? It's like, Okay, so you're not even looking to put him in prison. Like, that's not even part of what you're trying to do with the federal government. That is... No, the mystery. Uh, I don't think they would be successful if they tried to get him anyway. It's very Under the primary custody, uh, you know, just uh, typically the, the, the jurisdiction, the sovereign that has the primary custody keeps the, keeps the prisoner. So the state started all this. The state's going to keep defendant Murdoch. So, okay, she, now, we're, now we know that the goal has not been to put him in a federal prison. So where are we? We're, we're now where they've got him as a cooperating defendant. Mm -hmm. He, in effect, is what I'm just thinking forward here. Isn't it possible that as a cooperating defendant, he comes in and says, hey, put me on a polygraph. Russell Lafitte had nothing to do with anything. And if he passes that, that box or that polygraph, I don't know where that leads with after discovered evidence with Russell Lafitte. I just, I, again, it's just a mystery to me as to why the resources are being used. And it's not as if there aren't other crimes occurring, right, in South Carolina. There's a lot going on, I think, across the country, but certainly here. And so while this is a high profile case with lots of publicity, and, and, and uh, I get that, but so, why? It's so. a mystery. Well, and Drew, can you take us through like what this plea deal really looked like? Um, what did it? What were the brass tacks on this thing? Sure. So, it, it, 
it was pretty straightforward uh, in what you would expect from a, a, a a plea agreement uh, in that the defendant agrees to cooperate. Uh, Alec has said that he's going to be forthright and truthful uh, as much as you can take him at his word on that. Which uh, is not a law. Right? <laughs> <laughs> how, I, know, let's, let's, I mean, seriously, we're, we're, asking, we're asking Alec Mordak to, to not lie. Yeah. And he's cooperating. I mean, I, again, that's another, I, I'm just... I hate to go off on this too much, but it's just, just a mystery to me. You, you've got this known sociopath, right? I mean, even the best case scenario, he's stealing all these money from these innocent uh, citizens around the state. Uh, I think he's overwhelming evidence that he committed these double murders, and so you're prosecuting him for these financial crimes. Nothing, mm -hmm. you know, violent, the financial crimes, which I could see if the state weren't doing anything, but they've already made it very clear that they fully intend to lock him up for life with Again, with no parole, no chance of parole in, in the state system. So, you know, the prosecutor, maybe it's the forfeiture. That was something I was interested in you were telling me about. Yeah. So, yeah, so what are, what, are the, what are the plea deal? So, continuing on with that, that's part of Alec Murdoch's forfeiture, or part of his plea agreement is forfeiture. And forfeiture refers to his assets, his money. Um, and the specific forfeiture order, uh, consented to yesterday by Judge Gergel, the federal judge overseeing all things Murdoch in the federal system. He issued his written order today on that, and it, pursuant to the indictments from the U.S. Attorney's Office, they've identified, and Murdoch has admitted to, about $9 million in theft, which echoes pretty closely to theft, fraud, money laundering, et cetera. Damages, I guess you could call it. That's more of a civil term, but um, losses, $9 million in losses attributable to Alec Murdoch. Um, that forfeiture clause in his agreement, to the best of his ability, and that money is available and he has assets to do so, he's going to be required to pay restitution, right? And he has agreed to help the federal government get that money, get whatever assets he has, and turn it over to them so that they can apply it to his restitution and make his victims whole mm -hmm. financially. That is a major fly in the ointment to what's been happening for the last several years in civil court down in Beaufort County with the Mallory, excuse me, Hampton County with the Mallory Beach case, uh, peripheral to that, the Gloria Satterfield case, the Plyler case, all these civil lawsuits that have come in against Alec Murdoch. There is, there was a receivership order, a receivership, um, and you've probably heard this before, but it bears repeating an explanation. Judge Daniel Hall, the circuit judge who presides over the Mallory Beach case in state court, he, upon information from Mark Tinsley, uh, Eric Bland, others, issued a receivership, which is essentially, he put in place two court-appointed attorneys to receive all Alec Murdoch's assets, funds, money, and they, 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 another way to put it is they froze Alec Murdoch's assets. And they put these two lawyers in charge of it, go find all his assets, go find all his holdings, his accounts, his money, and whatever he has control over, land, real property, liquid assets, whatever it is, whatever he has control over, whatever's in his name, you take it, you seize it, you put it in uh, in escrow, and you mm -hmm. don't let a dime go in or out without court approval because we're going to make sure that mm -hmm. the people who have civil lawsuits against Alec are made whole. Mm -hmm. Those civil lawsuits, date, at least in the Beach case, dates back to 2019. There's already been a court-approved settlement in that. Earlier this year, Alec has, if you go back and look at the uh, settlement agreement on that, Alec, all the way back with his wife's estate's settlement. So the Beach case, they sued and it, the Beach family, along with the other victims of the boat crash, they all came in together. They made uh, a joint and several lawsuit against Murdoch, Parkers, all, all, all the big players in that that we've heard so much about. They sued them, they reached an agreement first with the estate of Maggie Murdoch, mm -hmm. whose name the Moselle, Moselle Road property was in, the 
big nice house, all the land, uh, farming equipment, all that. That was in Maggie's name. So it belonged to her estate. They had to sue Maggie's estate, get a settlement with the, conser with the, uh, with the personal representative, John Marvin, mm -hmm. Alex's brother. Uh, they got all that back in January. The settlement was approved. The clause in that settlement said Alec agrees to waive his right to appeal any further uh, decisions by the court with respect to the receivership. Then fast forward to this summer, we know the global settlement reached with Parker's, Murdoch, all of the, all of the, uh, the, I think it was the insurance company that had Alex's boat insurance policy. All these groups reached this settlement agreement with respect to the Beach case and the other, the other victims in the boat crash. Uh, that's all gone through court and approved. And just this week, this week, the receivers, those, those attorneys, they petitioned Judge Hall, uh, or they proposed an order to Judge Hall to set scheduling for mediation, claims, deadlines, oh, wow. and to get all wow. of that money, all wow. that liquid asset, it's all, it's all gone. It's all, and I spoke to Mark Tinsley about this yesterday. He said, it's, all, all of that has been liquidated. It's, yeah. The money is all accounted for. They've submitted their final, wow. it's $2.1 million is what they were able to come up with, less some attorney fees, uh, some uh, some other expenses and things like that, but it, the net was two point one million dollars, and now they have everything out of the way. It's time to distribute it. Then along comes Phil Barber at the very end of yesterday's hearing, and he petitions Judge. He asks Judge Gurgle, "Will you issue your order of forfeiture immediately?" And they want it seized by the Department of Justice that immediately. That's precedent, I believe, over the over Well, the that's state what court. they say, and they, well, I don't mean to interrupt. They were saying that this has to do with attorney fees, correct? They were saying they don't want hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, according to the defense team, to be <laughs> taken out yeah. at all right. for, um, out of this money, out of these yeah. monies. Mark Tinsley says that's not your money to, that money is liquidated, that money is... It's not Alex's money anymore. It's not Alex's money anymore. So what are they seizing? Um, interesting. It, and it does present quite an interesting dilemma. Uh, if you're looking for a dollar figure, let's take a step back. And I asked, I asked Jim and Dick this yesterday. Didn't you also try to take attorney fees? Didn't you also take attorney fees out of that money? And yes, they did. When Alec liquidated his 401k mm -hmm. before the murder trial, that's where $600,000 in attorney fees came from mm -hmm. to pay Jim, Dick, Maggie Fox, Phil Barber, their whole team uh, to, to, to represent Alex in that murder case. Then after the murder case was settled, they went back to the receivers and asked for another 140 or 160 mm -hmm. grand for additional attorney fees to litigate the appeal or adjudicate the appeal. And the receivers, the attorneys who are the receivers, they said no. That wasn't part of the part of our agreement. You're not getting any more money from us. They took it to Judge Hall. Judge Hall agreed with the receivers. And now, in the last few few months, uh, there's been two payouts. Now, those receivers who are managing all of Alex's money, those attorneys, they are entitled to legal fees for their work, and they have petitioned the court now on two occasions for money to get paid. Uh, and I think the sum total of the two the two um, the two payouts that they've gotten is about 500 grand, about half a million dollars, just a little bit over. So it was 200 something the first time, then 200 something the next time, and it, some total is about 500 grand that has been approved by the court. Uh, spoke to Mark Tinsley about that as well, and he said at the last most recent hearing they've had about this issue, the receivership attorneys have agreed to take no more uh, than what they've already taken. That's it. They're they're done, and it just so happens that there might be some sour grapes there with, with Murdoch's mm -hmm. folks. They, they couldn't get any more money out of it, and yet here are the receivers taking it. So they used that to frame what they did yesterday as bleeding, uh, burning up the money. Uh, yeah. That's what they called it. Um, and they just pointed that jab back wow. at the receivers. Now, was that an open court or was this in this was a press um, conference? At the press conference. Yes. Well, it was in the press conference, but during open court, that's when they did ask right, right. the judge to... And the monies that's in there right now, is that is that net of 
all attorney's fees or just the receiver's attorney's fees? I'm not 100% sure on that. So some of that money could be subject to further attorney's fees before it gets in the Probably. hands of, 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 of victims. Probably. Well, and so, that's what they were saying that they wanted to stop. stop they that. wanted to stop the bleeding of all the attorney's fees, let the DOJ seize it and move on. But but the question is, is what are they seizing? And, and another thing that, that Drew and I talked about earlier today was mm -hmm. we're dealing with criminal mm -hmm. seizure right. versus civil well, that's going to be a, another seizure. another fight, right? It sounds like in the Murdoch case, another fight over getting the money from well, state to federal. And what money at this point? Like that's what I keep on thinking about. Well, it's, like it's 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 a couple million dollars, but that money's already been divvied up, hasn't it? I mean, well, they're asking for the petition, but what's going to happen with this if it's successful? That money just is sent over to the to the federal government account, right? Not subject to anything, but going directly to the victims in the prosecution that they, he just pled to in federal court. Right. So they divert it all. It's going to make a lot of people unhappy. <laughs> so, you know, more to my point, that sort of adds to the confusion as to why you'd want to do this. But, uh, yeah, stirring the pot, that's a good word, because the money's <laughs> been taken from people, and they're probably expecting it like this month, right? Sounds like. Well, no, not, not that. <laughs> Who are you talking about? The ones in, uh, in, in state it court. You're saying getting no. divvied up right now? They would not get, they would not get this, this money wouldn't be divvied. Uh, according to the proposed scheduling order they put out this this week, they would not consider distributing the money until February of, of next year. Yep, February twenty twenty. Why the long wait? Because of the number of creditors and uh, claimants against Murdoch um, who wow. have who he owes money. Wow. Um, the anticipation. Wow. Of so they the, all might not get anything from it. The anticipation also of uh, mediation that's going to happen. They're, they've appointed a special referee. They they, they don't expect their, this to go <laughs> easily because there's so no. many people owed money, entitled to money, and, and so little enough. money that the receivers have actually been able to recover. And I think that's what yeah. might be sort of, uh, and I'm, this is speculative, and I, I try not to do this, but I think that that might be what's hinted at in the plea agreement for Murdoch is that, hey, I might know where some more money is. <laughs> and, 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 yes, thank you. And That's come, exactly right. Because what what happened with um, what mm. happened very notably with the um, very notably with the his four hundred one k initially, uh, due what I would due to what I would deem a technicality, the receivers could not access Mur Murdoch's four hundred one k. It was his four. It was in his name. Right. But. Federal law. Something, or the, no, this was the state. They could no, but not. but the federal law pr would protect uh, retirement money, I think, in 401ks from, from uh, attachment. From seizure. Yeah, seizure. And, and so essentially he had to, Murdoch had to agree to right. give to it to them. Yeah, and, yeah. That, and that's how they came by it. So it would seem that there might be more accounts like that. Where well, that would be good if they found that. That would be a positive. Well, I mean, there have been rumors, at the rumor mill of Hampton County and Colleton County have been running with, where the rest of the Murdoch mm -hmm. money is. I mm -hmm. mean, it's in our it's in our our title of our <laughs> podcast. I mean, you go. can't get away from yeah. from that part of it. But what I thought was interesting yesterday that I was just surprised that the federal government brought it up. The prosecutors, Miss Limehouse, said that we're not actually asking for all the money that we think he took. We think he took more like ten and a half million mm -hmm. at least. Mm -hmm. The nine million is just the number that we've sort of settled on. Absolutely. Like that's the number we're settling on right now. But then she throws this ten and a half million number out, right. and then to Drew's point, which I think is very interesting, is this whole polygraph. Like, why do we keep on talking about a polygraph? Why, why do we need to talk about a polygraph when we're talking in the same sentence about Alec Murdoch and telling the truth? I would love to see how he would do on a polygraph. Oh, actually, I think he'll do brilliantly. These, <laughs> these polygraphers uh, claim that they can detect. Like Lies. a lie, right? Yeah, and uh, it'd be very interesting to see how if they in fact do that. So what? So back we'll to your point, it. like, what if he says, uh, if they actually want to ask the question? So was Russell Lafitte involved? Was oh. Corey Fleming involved? And he says, absolutely not. It was always just me. They knew nothing. I, I don't want to get too far down that speculation road okay. because it, there was a there was a caveat, a, a a qualifier in the plea agreement with respect to the polygraph. It was regarding the recovery of the recovery and forfeiture of finances oh, only I, I would need to pull it up and look at that i think it was i think it was that specific yes well, maybe they're um, so on this. does yeah. does russell lafitte know where the money is <laughs> yeah, that's right. it's uh, not how you ask it <laughs> but 
I, the other thing that struck me is a couple points I want to get off on. That. One, I'll start with the humorous one. Um, back when Russell Lafitte was requesting his new trial uh, uh, for after discovered, uh, he made a motion for a new trial based on after discovered evidence of Murdoch's murder trial uh, Swearing mm -hmm. that, um, right, yeah. swearing that Lafitte had nothing to do with it, and Lafitte's attorneys immediately filed a request for a new trial and, and with Judge Gergel, and the states are the the U.S. Attorney's Office response to that. Um, one of the prosecutors on Emily Limehouse's team is Katie Stoughton, and she 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 wrote it was one of my favorite things I've read in a filing all the legal filings I read. Uh, going back years on this, but she, she essentially she said, could not think of a less credible person to use as your witness uh, to, for, uh, to come make an excuse like this. To say that you didn't do it. Yeah, she could not think of a less credible person than Alec Murdoch. Um, and yeah. It's, it's just, it, you, you can't believe that we're here where we are right now, still talking yeah, about to, this. Yeah, and, you know, not to switch subjects here unless you want to, but the, we've got the jury stuff going on, right? And uh, at the same time. And we're so in the middle moving. of it. We're in the thick of it. I mm -hmm. mean, it's Friday. I'm expecting another last minute Friday something possibly because mm -hmm. that's what happens to us, it seems right. like. And yeah, we've got appeals going uh, this this request, we've got the new response. Did you see the response? I did. That was uh, very um, biting, would it be the word I'd use? Yeah. Ooh, yeah, mm -hmm. it was, wasn't it? A little it? personal, maybe? Oh, absolutely. So, so should we should we switch gears well, here and start? So I, okay, before we'll put a we'll put yeah. a button on we'll put a button on the federal stuff and what's coming down the road. And it, that's what I'm. I've spent the last since we got out of court yesterday. I've been trying to figure out what's going to happen next. So, with respect to, with respect to the forfeiture, right? It would appear, just based on a layman's quick Google search and uh, reading through a few things, I found what is the Department of Justice, the Department of Justice's asset forfeiture manual that they send out to all their folks, and. That's about the only thing I could really definitively find. I don't know if that necessarily applies to this or if it's the right source material, but it's the only thing I could find. Mm -hmm. And in that manual for the federal government, the, it says that based on a 2017 Attor U.S. Attorney General order and ruling, the federal government doesn't have to do not stop, do not pass, you know, they don't have to really consult with anyone if there is a forfeiture order and there are seized assets and those assets are tied to a federal crime if even if the state seizes them first for state crimes if those crimes are also federal crimes the federal government can just say hey local police department thanks for the money and it's it's theirs they if there's a forfeiture order if there's a seizure order or something like that they can take it where it gets a little murky uh, in my reading of all those things, we have to remember that the receivership order was not pursuant to crimes. Like they, they, didn't, they didn't order this, they didn't order their Alex, Murdoch, Alex Murdoch's assets to be frozen and put into court control. They didn't order that because of crimes he'd committed. They ordered it because of pending civil litigation where there was abundant evidence judgments were coming and he was going to be liable to mm -hmm. pay these people damages. Now, there have been some secondary, secondary is not the right word, but after the fact lawsuits to come in, say from Eric Bland representing the Satterfield family and the Plyler sisters, those lawsuits do directly tie to criminal activity. The, for which he pleaded yesterday. Murdoch pleaded guilty to crimes directly related to the Satterfields and the Plylers. There's this, that, it would seem, based on my reading of that, that yeah, technically, it could mess with what they're able to, uh, what they're able to get from Alex on the back end, mm -hmm. since those, it, the same money and the same lawsuits are all kind of mixed in together. But again, with the beaches, there wasn't any crime. Uh, it, and I'm not saying that there was no crime that occurred with the boat crash or anything that has gone on with the beach case. I, I'm saying right. specific right. specific to what happened there with the lawsuit. There was not any theft 
uh, from the Beach family or anything like that that would pre you preclude. Also got. Yeah, they so there's that's where it gets kind of murky and what has happened and you know again as I pointed out there's already been a settlements approved there's already been uh, like where the, the it, that money is not Absolutely. free and clear and to to the point that Mark Tinsley has made to me and when we spoke to him and of course he you know. Uh, Mark has not steered us wrong. He's been uh, very forthright with us and very helpful to us. But again, he does represent his clients. He has his take on things, and his take is always going to be most beneficial for his clients. Uh, and his take is that this this is a nothing that the there is that money is no longer subject to being forfeited. They're not going to get their hands on it, and. It may and very here well comes be. here comes we marching the federal government. We shall say. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it may very yeah, yeah. well be that yeah. Mark, Mark is right. You and, see this badge? Yeah. Uh, so I, yeah. yeah, that that's well, kinda, it's going to be interesting. Be. This is this is one match. Another that, fight. And and in which court and who's judge right. and who decides? So it, what we got yesterday in the midst of all this, we we were it was foreshadowed during the press conference. Someone asked, mm -hmm. you know, sort of when are you going to file your response to the response of the state right. on the jury tampering? charges, uh, allegations, excuse me, uh, the allegations that they have put forth that um, the Colleton County Clerk of Court, Becky Hill, was uh, what the defense team's trying to say is somehow were involved with jury tampering on the double murder trial. So now we get uh, from Dick Harputley and during the press conference he goes, well, uh, we got to get to crime con. Not kidding. <laughs> got to bring that back up. Got to catch a flight. We, we got to catch a flight. I don't know if we're going to have time. You know, when are we going to? When are we going to get this this response through? But of course, they were taking it seriously. They they said they were going to wait until today to do it, but they actually got it out yesterday. Mm -hmm. In the middle of everything, mm -hmm. we get a, you know, the press corps gets a, another email, mm -hmm. another little right. little little. Little bombshell just right. drops off in there in the middle of the day as we're trying to deal with this federal case, um, and it basically your take, Charlie, is this? Um, it, basically, they just were angry that they had to get an affidavit from Alec Murdoch. That's the way I read it. And um, did you agree though? Did you agree that that was not good case law that they had cited? That that well, why did they need to show? I mean. Alec Murdoch was on television every day. We saw it on uh, internationally. Why right. would we have to say that? I know. Well, they tried to distinguish the case and this DeAngelis case. And I do think that the practice is people don't get these affidavits. And so it's sort of lost out there whether or not that's still good law or not or whether it could be distinguished. But they did that. But one thing about Alec Murdoch's affidavit, I don't know if you noticed this or not, the, the Attorney General intimated that this was a recently sort of fabricated claim, basically, the way he sort of phrased it. And so they want to know when Alex Murdoch learned about it. They never, he didn't answer that. He simply said that he didn't, mm. he learned about it after the jury verdict, but didn't say when in that period of time. If you read very closely his, his sworn affidavit. Is that a problem? I just thought it, it sort of begged the question because they're, they're going to come back, I'm assuming at some point, and arguing this, that, that that if you learned about this that, that next day or two, mm -hmm. two or three days later and didn't alert anybody where something could be done perhaps more quickly with an investigation, I don't think it's fatal to, to, to the defense's claim. If they, can, if they can belly up, so to speak, and prove that, in fact, these things occurred, I think all bets are off. But I saw a little maneuvering within both of those, uh, those filings. But, yes, you're right. That, that, that there was an affidavit. They said not necessary, but, by the way, here it is. You know, so here, know. it just keeps going on and on. Well, it? I know it was. Yeah. It, it absolutely. Um, it, it obviously they were like, oh well, we'll just get this out. Like right. this, if this is what they want, then here you go. Yeah. We don't think this is necessary. It's terrible case law, but we're gonna we're gonna take care of it so we can move forward. And a jive against the, anything but, a little bit against the attorney general personally. Oh, completely. And then this yeah. Objective uh, investigation by Sled. There was some right snide remarks. Righteous yeah, indignation, yeah. yeah. But and then Drew, then you get a, then you see something filed today. <laughs> there, there was a, there was a filing today yes. from the the clerk from the appeals court and just alerting uh, Mr. Harputlian that his his filing yesterday was deficient uh, according to like a form like Rule Two Hundred Four or, or some some uh, so, some procedural rule that he had yeah. to he didn't quite 
get correct he when he filed. He didn't <laughs> like the wrong like. Uh, yeah, he, he didn't. He didn't. He just didn't structure the the filing properly. I guess as far as a motion <laughs> um, for what he wanted, and they just said before the court can proceed, you need to refile this in the proper format. <laughs> and, you get on that plane. <laughs> <laughs> that was just. But after all that, it, it was it was a the filing. If you haven't seen it or haven't read it. Um, from the appeals court, it, it was just Dick Harputlian at his performative best, um, just the most, just yeah, indignant. Yeah, I noticed you signed it. I think you, I felt like you wrote it. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, the, 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 you can tell yeah, from, yeah. The, you know from, the pro, from the prose in it, uh, the, the language, the vocabulary. Yeah. He does not back off. Dick went just full bore uh, using his best Oh, uh, man, just per good. again per good. performative, really taking a taking the the preposterous, yeah, yeah, taking the, the attorney general's office to the woodshed. Mm -hmm. This is outlandish. This is this is he called it mulish, which I thought was a, a fantastic word, <laughs> mulish and bad faith. And he said, just raked him over the coals. But the very end, of it. but if you want an affidavit from my client, by God, here it is. Yeah, <laughs> we got just, one for you. Hey, now, there was a clip. We might have to throw it in there. Uh, uh, from from Dick Harputlian yesterday as well. I put it into the story that I did, but um, he was very clear. He said uh, when he was talking about, um, you know, how does your so one of the questions at the press conference was, how does your client, how is how is your client feeling about all of this mm -hmm. going on? He goes, he goes, Alec, Alec will tell you two things. He stole the money and he did not kill Maggie and Paul. He got in one more time, and then. Um, you know, I think that's going to be their line that's, through the you know, whole thing. That's actually admissible potentially in a criminal case. You've know, got the lawyer. I don't know. This, that's why I find just so going back to the reason the federal government's prosecuting. It's it's the whole line has been yes, we stole all this money, mm -hmm. no question about it. But when it comes to these state court prosecutions, they're they're putting the the state to the test. And so this whole idea that Alex has taken responsibility, he's remorseful. Mm -hmm. I just question the um, sincerity of all that. Yeah, he got up. I don't. He got up there and said, um, "I want to take responsibility." Murdoch did up at, in front of Gurgle yesterday. I want my son to see me take responsibility. Oh, he did himself. And he was it's, under oath, right? Ab absolutely. It's my hope that by taking responsibility, people I've hurt can begin to heal. Okay. And I mean, you don't have to get into this right now, but but the question is, is who is going to get? reimbursed to some degree and yeah. I think that is one concern, real concern you've got the most vulnerable clients that we've heard about that have been heartbreaking the the Pinckney's the Satterfields the Badgers and we now know that these schemes go back to 2005 right. uh, that he was just doing it on his own before he figured out how to yeah. put it in a bank or something like that he would just write it off as a medical right. uh, lien that he had to take care of or something but um, you know they're the other victims that have right. a lot more savvy when it comes to yeah, like yeah. legal yeah. power. So you've got law. I saw two law partners there yesterday. Oh, they were at yeah, the, Ronnie at the Crosby and Mark Hall were there the with their <sighs> shaking their heads and uh, yeah, wow. angry. Wow. Um, Was there any questions at the press conference as to why he wouldn't plead in state court for these financial crimes? <laughs> they didn't. Get they far. did not, but that's yeah. what November 27th is yeah, all right about. And yeah. it's, it's just confounding yeah. the amount of resources that are going into the prosecution of a man who already is serving two life sentences. Yeah, now, but I do get, I mean, from, from my perspective, and by the way, I don't think actually Dick's statement would be admissible in a criminal case now I think about it, but to me from the state perspective, and of course, under our Constitution, <laughs> The, the primary responsibility for law enforcement is the state government. You know, the federal government is supposed to be a limited government, and the state takes care of, of everything else that the federal government isn't specifically supposed to do. And so when you look at what he did, as to point more to Creighton Waters' point at, at the uh, more recent uh, uh, plea for F Fleming, all these things are happening in the state court system. The murders, of course, were in the state system. So we're going to take care of these things. And he kept talking about not letting someone go down the street, so to speak, to get right. a better deal. Right. And so I do Prison think that, again. yeah, and I do think that the effort of, of, of General Wilson to not only prosecute fully the, the uh, murder cases, 
But he mentioned this as being a, a bit of an insurance policy also. We need to help have another life sentence. And we've got this really strict law in South Carolina, three strikes and you're in for certain crimes. And he's got three of those, the three breach of trust with financial uh, intent. I believe it's over 10,000. They've got three of them. And so he's going to be convicted of those three. And there's going to be an insurance policy for sure, no parole, life sentence, and a South Carolina prison. So I think that resource is appropriate. I guess the, I keep going back to this, it's just a mystery to me as to the federal government resource being added on top of this. What would we be, we're up three, li three, double life three consecutive life sentences, right. and now we have time, what was it, 30 years or so, and potentially? 30 years for four of the counts and mm -hmm. 20 years for the rest. Yeah, so they'll do under the guidelines, 18. there'll be something different than that. But anyhow, and she herself was saying that there's no thought of him serving a day, right, in federal prison. It's so. a mystery. Um, do you think we're going to get an answer to that? Do you think we're going to be able to get to the bottom of this, in other words, of why the federal government keeps on prosecuting? I think Drew, I think Drew Tripp can. I've got two things that I, that I want to that yeah. I want to touch on. First, with, res, with responding to a question Ann posed a minute ago, who's going to get who's going to get the money? Who's going to get if this? it does end up that the federal government seizes the money. Or they find more money. Or that they find more money. But it just, in terms, just in terms of who, it, it, and this was another mm -hmm. takeaway from the, the post-hearing press conference, Tick Harputley and Jim Griffin were saying that they, that they just want to make, you know, make sure that the victims have more money, um, that Alex's victims get more money. That's part of, that was part of their uh, uh, moral high ground on why they were petitioning for forfeiture to the government so that the attorneys could stop bleeding the assets dry through the receivership. Um, problem with that, which a few people have pointed out, is that if you go back and you look at Russell Lafitte and you look at Corey Fleming, the restitution they were ordered to pay was not to any individuals, but to organizations, two organizations, in fact. That would be Palmetto State Bank, and Parker Law Group, formerly Murdoch, Peters Murdoch, Parker, Eltsaroth, and Dietrich, uh, the law firm of Alec Murdoch. They are getting the restitution mm -hmm. from the federal government in the in these cases. Just those two, or other ones? No, too? it's them. It's just it's just those two. Yes, because and uh. the the what ones what ends up being what ends up is being the line of rationale in, through this. Par, uh, Parker Law Group. When they first learned, no wonder they were there. Uh, when they yeah. first learned of all this, yeah. they jumped into action and immediately did the math, figured out how much how much Alex stole. They went to the the parties who were owed the money, mm -hmm. and they settled. They they cut them checks. Said, "Here, Alex stole this. Is from, this is money that you were supposed to get." To he, listen to a Mark Tinsley or Justin Bamberg, who represents the the Pinckney family. That's not fair. That, that's not, it, it, like, this was, so the, you take into account these thefts occurred, the, these frauds, these, this embezzlement, this yeah, all occurred back in, like, 2012, 2013. Yeah, there's you no add inflation, table, you right. add an interest, inflation, interest, those two things right. alone, plus the actual, you know, penalty for doing uh, an assessment for actually doing the crime, they're not, their point is that their clients should be getting more than just the, the right. base, what the base stole. amount of money. What he sold back right, in yeah. 2013 right, right. or yes. whatever. Right. Well, and, and to that point, just to add on, the, you know, I had been doing interviews with mm -hmm. one of his alleged victims, Tommy Moore, and one of the big sticking points was that attorney's fees was still getting pulled I out for, you know, from the PMPED law firm. Yeah, right. So there's money there that could be still, they could be, I'm not saying that that hasn't been rectified and sorted out now, but but those were some of the, that's where the money started to kind of right. fall so through the cracks. If the federal government gets this two million plus, that money goes to the, the Parker Law Group and to, to what other entity? Potentially, uh, and Palmetto State Bank. Because they, wow. Oh, and by the way, uh, Mr. Lafitte was at that uh -huh. uh, hearing yesterday as well. Um, I, I saw Russell Lafitte's father there. Because it, it, yeah. <laughs> he was sitting in the corner, right there. Well, you know, to me, uh, play a little bit of a devil's advocate. You know, these, the, and I, 
have respect for Parker Law Group. I have respect for the bank, as far as I know. But they're the ones that put these agents out there, these agents of criminality. I mean, they're, they're you know, it's not as if, I mean, they're controls with, I mean, they're agents of those groups, aren't they? And so for them to then get back the funds, I don't know who's not getting the money from the $2 million, but it just seems to me to have a federal government prosecution right. to swoop in and get this $2 million and to divert it back to those two entities. That could be uh, really, really a, a sticking point for these civil attorneys, too. Source subject. Too. Source subject. These yeah. are civil attorneys. Yeah, and there's and people, are their be... clients aren't getting money they thought was coming their way, right? Yeah, and we could be jumping the gun, I guess, a little bit because mm -hmm. none of this has actually right. transpired, mm -hmm. we should say. But, I mean, and I don't think this is speculation, though. I think this is good, like, how, what are the different scenarios that we're looking right, at? Right. Like, best case, worst case. Right. Um, I think that's more where everyone is kind of going because they're giving it to us to shuffle through. It's right. not like they've been clear right. on exactly Moving how this targets. is going. Yeah. Right. I mean, even talking to the federal prosecutors yesterday after after the hearing, well, are you going to seize the money? I mean, that's what we asked. Like, right. I literally walked up and said, so is this what you're going to do? And, you know, basically they looked at me and said, well, we don't know. Wow. Okay. We did. They, this is the first time we've heard about it. And in the defense, <laughs> like, in the, in this, in this and scenario. the defense handed up the forfeiture order to Judge Gurgel at the hearing. The defense did. Oh. Or did he have I, it already, Judge Gurgel? I don't know. Okay. Do you know? What, what was the, question? the forfeiture was order? Was there a forfeiture you... order signed by Judge Gurgel at the at the plea hearing? It was it, he voice order, and the, it has since been wow. okay. ordered. Uh, it's on it's on Pacer now. It, it, wow. So it's okay. it's out there. A forfeiture so order. It, wow. It okay. Is, okay. So if you're the receiver, you can't really distribute the money until that issue's resolved. Right. Right. So, uh, <laughs> so again, delay, trip, roadblock. Make it harder. Uh, uh, there, uh, there is a concerted effort here, for better or worse, from Murdoch's attorneys that is evident to make it as hard as possible on the actors in the state theater of this trial. Um, whether they are doing their reasons for doing so, uh, if they, they feel like they are legally uh, they are legally sound in that, and that they are mm -hmm. they're just doing what's right for their client, or whether there is this is devolved into personal vendetta, and um, it, it, that that's between them. Uh, but it certainly it had, takes on that appearance. Well, and it certainly sets the stage. If we do, by some crazy chance, end up back in a, you know, sitting in a double murder trial. Mm -hmm. Boy, yes. talk yeah. about fireworks. Yeah, the, um, that's, a, that's a fun thing to think about, maybe not so fun thing to think about, uh, going to sit through that again. Uh, I would, we are pretty confident that, I don't think, it would, it would probably not be a six week trial again if we, if we did it, I don't think. Um, I think it would be more consolidated than that. But one, one more thing that I, just where my head went while we were talking about this, why is the federal government doing this? Why, why, why? And again, to, to Ann's point, maybe there's more money and then you have to think maybe what if the government has information that there's a bigger fish or that there are more fish um, that the state hasn't been able to pursue or isn't able to pursue. That's um, fascinating. Uh, and that, again, that might, that is purely speculative. Uh, there, that could end up not being true. I remember we spoke to someone uh, on the prosecution team for the state at one point. There was, a, there was a lot made when it first became evident that Alec Murdoch was involved with drugs, uh, with a drug trafficking angle through Eddie Smith and the guys from Walterboro. There was a thought that there might be some tie back to a notorious street gang based out of Colleton County called the Cowboys. Uh, there was a huge federal indictment and prison sentences for a bunch of those ca characters back in 2017, 2016, 2017, where they they cleaned up a lot of for racketeering, uh, RICO cases, uh, drugs, money, all kinds of stuff, They where they cleaned out a lot of those gang members over in Colleton County. And the when that name started getting floated out there again, the Cowboys surrounding Alec Murdoch, that was 
certainly alarming and eye-opening to a lot of people, especially who had heard of that gang and what their uh, track record was before. A lot of shootings, a lot of drive-by shootings, all just very... Not, not a good look for the front porch of the local Yeah, country. not at all. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it, and that, it, as time went on, uh, it's, it's been character, characterized as a red herring mm -hmm. to intimate that the Cowboys were involved in that. Uh, in any way or tied to Alec Murdoch in any way. Um, but we haven't uh, seen uh, the end you know, of this. We have not yeah, written the last I mean, chapter on it, this giving, yet. Giving the, yeah, to Charlie's point about the devil's advocate, giving the federal government credit and to think that there's more to this that might be up there, up their alley a little bit. And they're, they're, there's a long game here being played. Mm -hmm. Who knows? Uh, could there be more more coming down? And that, I guess that remains to be seen. I think that's probably a good place to wrap it up today. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for joining us My today. Pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you, Drew. Thank you, Sam, for taking care of us today. We will be following this. We expect more developments mm -hmm. shortly. Um, possibly if there is another Court update. Appeals. Yeah, the Court of Appeals. The Court well, of Appeals has to get back to mm -hmm. us, right? We mm -hmm. need to know whether or not there is enough for or them an to hearing. have an evidentiary well, yeah. hearing. And, um, and we don't really even know when that would happen, do right. we? No. Uh, so we still have a lot happening in the Murdoch case. So uh, stay with us, Unsolved South Carolina, the Murdoch Murders, Money and Mystery. We will be keeping you up to date here online at News 4, there's a lot of ways to catch us on our Twitter handles as well. So thank you so much for joining us, and we will probably see you very soon. <laughs>